Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Amen. Happy Sabbath, graduates. Did Andrew sneak out? Where did Andrew go? Upstairs. Upstairs. Good. All right. Congratulations to you. As you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is the first step by God's grace. You will not only have success in your career, in your academics, but as powerful soldiers for Christ, all of us, you and the graduates here, all of us will be ready as we press towards the mark. That is the name of my sermon this morning. And I want to start by telling you about a 12-year-old girl named Robin. Now, Robin is a Christian girl, well-behaved, well-mannered, and unlike many Christians, young and old, she's not ashamed to tell people about Jesus. She's not ashamed to tell them how much she loves God. In fact, for one of her school projects, she gets up in front of the class and gives a presentation of why she is a Christian. And she enumerates the experience kneeling down with her parents, confessing her sins, asking Jesus to come into her heart. Can you all hear me well without this? Perfect. She felt instantly better. She knew the moment that Christ came into her heart, and she knew she had this peace that she would live eventually forever with Christ. Now, the class, this was a secular school, but her classmates really appreciated this. They saw she poured out her heart on something that was very close and personal to her. And she was feeling pretty good about herself. Until the teacher said, anyone have any questions for her? And good old Oscar raises his hand. And Oscar has a slew of questions, and it starts pretty good, but eventually Robin finds herself grasping at straws. So he starts and says, how did your life change? She said, well, you know, I stopped watching certain types of movies, stopped watching TV, certain TV shows, stopped listening to certain kinds of music. And he said, but I thought you said your life was better. Why would, why would your life change for the better if you stopped doing those things that you like to do? And she said, because my sins had been forgiven. And he said, huh? She said, when you do bad things, that's sinning. And sinning will sooner or later catch up with you. So when Jesus died, his blood washed away my sins. And that's why I felt better. Understand? He said, no. Why did Jesus have to die? She said, I told you that. When Jesus died, he washed away my sins. No, 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 no. You said he died for your sins, but I want to know why did he have to die? Couldn't he have taken away your sins without dying? And she says, well, no. Why not? Well... It doesn't work that way. Why? It just doesn't. Look, when you're a Christian, there are certain things that don't have answers, certain things you can't explain. You have to take them by faith. Oh. Now, do you think that Oscar was satisfied with that response? No. Now, you're probably all thinking, well, she's only 12 years old. Let's give her a break. But Oscar's not thinking that. Oscar says, you know, this girl came up here and she poured out her heart. She has this thing. She's obviously thought about it. She's prayed about it. She's been convicted about it. And here it is. There's this question I've asked and she doesn't know the answer to. Now, he does not know that there is an answer to that question. He does not know. It's not something we take by faith. And as such, because she know, he knows for whatever reason she doesn't have an answer, he starts to have a little doubt about this thing she's been talking about. And her, Robin is thinking, hmm, she starts to doubt and she starts to feel discouraged and it leads her inexorably to two choices. One is to stop telling people she's a Christian. Stop telling people about Jesus. That way she won't be encountered with questions to which she doesn't know the answer. That's not acceptable and she knows that. The other choice is to begrudgingly do something that makes young and young in heart cringe and that is to study to show herself a worker approved. Now again, she's only 12 years old. If she can learn that lesson now, it's gonna be a powerful impact in helping her run towards the mark and finish the race. But if she doesn't, she will be like many of us who are two and three and four and five times her age and still find ourselves not having graduated from spiritual milk and going to eating spiritual solid food. Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer.
Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us here this morning. I thank you for encouraging us to finish this race. I thank you for the tools you've given us. I ask that you would open our hearts this morning, help us to understand the words that you have put in my mouth and the message you've given all of us. Let us be changed for the better and let us meet you in glory when you come to save us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The title of my sermon, Pressing Towards the Mark, is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verse 14, which we all should know pretty well. I press towards the mark, forward, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, pressing towards the mark, we see Paul often using this kind of imagery of athletics, racing. And we're going to dive a little bit more into that in just a few moments here. How many of you have your swords? Raise them up. If you have a phone, you have a Bible. I want you to raise those up too. Okay, because we're going to be really, really diving into this world. I want you to be quick with it because you might get lost. And if you do miss something, I invite you to write down. Write down these texts so you can study them later. Amen? The framework of our sermon this morning is going to be based on three texts. And I want you to look up all three of them. Stick your finger in them, put a piece of paper in them so we can look at all three of them. You know, some folks learn better by visual reading, others learn better by hearing. If you can combine the both, then you have an exponentially higher chance of this absorbing. So I'm going to give you these three texts, if that's all right with you. We're going to mark them, we're going to read them. The first text is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. The second text is in the following book, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And our last text that will round out our three topics this morning will be 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. So our three texts, once again, are 1 Timothy 4, 7 and 8, 2 Timothy 2, 5, and 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do we have them? Amen. The first text. (laughs) First text is in the first Timothy four, seven and eight. Now, most of my texts that I would read to you will be from the New King James or the King James version. But this text, I'm actually taking from a version I don't particularly care for. That's the NIV. And we're going to see why in just a minute. First Timothy four, seven and eight says, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales. Rather, Train yourself to be godly. Listen here. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. That is our first topic, spiritual training. And we're going to draw some contrasts and comparisons with physical training. Our second text, 2 Timothy 2, 5. Paul says, and if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. Now, in order to know the rules, you have to be educated. And that is our second topic, spiritual education. Now, it does go hand in hand with spiritual training, but we're going to see why I made that distinction and why I put them in that order. Our final text is 1 Corinthians 9, 24. And that Paul says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But one receives the prize, thus runs in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself shall become disqualified. That's our third topic this morning, spiritual purpose. Now, we all agree that even though we're in this metaphorical race, we're not competing against each other, right? But there is only one prize. And as such, I need to run. Every step I take needs to be in the forward direction. I can't make a sideways step, and I can't, God forbid, be going backwards. So I have to have spiritual purpose and understanding everything that I do must be helping me go towards that mark for that one prize because there's no second place and there is no third place. Those are our three topics, spiritual training, spiritual education, and spiritual purpose. Now, 
Let's look at the historical context of these images. Paul loves these, this, 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 this uh, athletics. He loves boxing. He loves these things not because he's obsessed with them, but he understands this is a way to reach people. These are things that folks are obsessed with. And as such, there's a way that he can, as Jesus did, turn into a parable and have some understanding come as a result. So let's understand what was going on in his day. At his time, there was what was known as the Isthmian Games, which was held every two years in the springtime in Greece. And athletes would converge, and they would participate in numerous events. Uh, we had foot races and wrestling and boxing, throwing the discus and the javelin. Now, at the beginning of each of, the ga of, of these games, each athlete would take an oath that they would follow the rules because they know they'd be disqualified. That sound familiar? And if they were disqualified, it was very dishonorable. It's not something you ever wanted to experience. Many of us may be familiar with events we have today, whether it's the Olympics, Super Bowl, NBA Finals. None of that compared to the allure of the Isthmian Games. This thing was really, really popular. And also, there was a vast difference between the way physical conditioning was for these guys back then and for the same events now. For example, when you think of boxing today, you have two men or two women. They have a couple of gloves. They have a mouth guard. They have trunks, a top for the woman. And there are 12 rounds that are timed. And at the end of each round, the bell rings, and each can go to their separate corners. They can rest. They can get some help physically. They can get some words of encouragement, some advice from their coach. And the, the match would end if someone gets knocked out or if at the end of 12 rounds, no one's knocked out, the judges would make a decision. Not so back then. Back then, first of all, there was no time limit. So you had matches that would literally go on for three and four hours. Imagine the conditioning required to be able to withstand that. Secondly, they didn't just have on some gloves and trunks. They would wrap themselves from head to toe with leather, with iron, with spikes. Can you imagine a fight and someone's got a spike? Someone's got spikes all over their body. So imagine, again, there's a certain physical regimen that had to be followed there was a training that had to be followed, and if you deviated from that, it could cost you the crown, it could cost you an eye, a limb, or maybe even your life. Because the match would not end until someone was knocked out, someone was killed, or if they were able, someone could raise their index finger and indicate that they wanted to end the match. So God forbid if you're getting pummeled and you can't raise your index finger, there was no referee to bail you out. So again... This is the backdrop for what Paul was trying to explain here. Those guys back then, nowadays we have three prizes in the Olympics, don't we? We have gold, we have silver, and we have bronze. They had one prize, one crown they competed for, so there was no working out, no conditioning, no physical labor with second place in mind, with third place in mind. There was no runner-up. So this is the, the backdrop we find ourselves with. And let's dive into this first topic of spiritual training. Understanding what Paul was trying to say, understanding that he says these things are important, and if you falter, you will have difficulty in your spiritual training. Now, those of you who were here for old year's service at the end of last year, remember my acronym PRAYER when we're talking about spiritual training. P-R-A-Y-E-R. -E and we're doing a comparison between spiritual training and physical training. The P stands for personal trainer. Now, if you have a goal as someone working out, you have a weight that you want to drop to, or you have a weight that you want to increase to, you want to tone, you want to do whatever it is, I don't care how much you study, you read, you look at videos, if you've never had a personal trainer, you're going to have a very difficult time attaining that goal. Not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult, because that trainer is going to have a relationship you with over time. They're going to tailor a plan for you. They're going to know exactly how much you can lift. They're going to know how much you can't lift. They know when it's ready to increase the weight. And they're going to be there with you, encouraging you all along, every step of the way. That's how God is with us. But unlike a physical trainer, where after a while, you can probably go out on your own. After you have a physical trainer show you the ropes for a few months or maybe a year or two, you can go and you now know how to educate yourself. You now know what things to look for. But with God, not only is he directing us, 
Not only is he guiding us, not only is he giving us the weights we can handle, and he is giving us encouragement through, it is he who is doing the work. The text that I have for P is Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Philippians 2, 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And we know that exactly two chapters later, Paul says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In other words, our personal trainer is the one who's doing the work through us. If we're out there trying to pump the spiritual irons on our own without God, it is all in vain. The next letter is R. That R, that first R stands for repetitions. And when you're in the gym, we're going to explore this more a little bit later when we talk about education. When you're in the gym, if you've never lifted before, you can't come and start lifting 100-pound barbells. This is not going to work. You have to start at a level that will be comfortably allow you to do repetitions, maybe sets of 10, sets of 15, three at a time on each side. And your personal trainer is going to guide you. Maybe he tries to give you a little bit more and you can't handle it. So he says, okay, let's keep you at this level so you can comfortably go through those repetitions. Now, spiritual reps, we can think of it as many ways. We can think of it as the word of God. Psalm 119, 11 says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And in verse 105, it says, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You can't just take those verses once, twice a week. You can't just read your favorite chapters. Your repetitions means that you are on a consistent basis reading and studying with your personal trainer. How many of us, I don't want to ask that question, many of us can quote John 3.16, 23rd Psalm, Genesis 1.1, John 11.35, Jesus wept. But beyond that, do we have a real understanding, a real knowledge of the word? And if we don't, we have to up our reps so that we can continue that process. Another form of spiritual reps are the trials that God allows us to experience. I mentioned that personal trainer is very aware of what you're capable of. And God, we know, only gives us, more than, only gives us what we can handle. And not only will a good personal trainer understand what your limits are, once you've been lifting that amount comfortably, he's not going to keep you at that level. He's going to increase it so that muscle gets stronger. And God's the same way. Our text for that is Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Romans 5, 3, where Paul says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and character hope. Here we see a building process, which we'll explore later when we talk about education. One on top of another. So the more trials that you're able to get through with God's help, it may seem like the next trial is more difficult. That's because he knows you can handle it, and he wants you to build that muscle of faith. The A in our acronym prayer for spiritual training stands for appetite. Just like in the races in Paul's day, if you slipped up and you ate a donut one day, if you slipped up and ate something that violated your physical regimen, that could cost you. Maybe the crown, maybe some serious physical damage, maybe even your life and your spiritual appetites the same way. How can, you, how can you expect to have spiritual growth in your body if you're putting things in your body that will harm it? You're putting things that will not give you a chance to fight against the flesh. You have your spirit and your flesh warring, and the side that you feed is a side that's going to win. Galatians 5.24 tells us that they that are Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So whatever we consume, whether physically or spiritually, will have a positive or negative effect on us and will either drive us closer to the mark or further from the mark. This is the direction we want to go. I have a couple other texts here. This is a progress that we'll find ourselves hating sin. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 says that we should hate what is evil, and cling to what is good. And Psalms 97.10 says, Let those who love the Lord hate evil. You know, there was a rock star in, back in the day. And at his concerts, he would pass around a bowl. Everyone would spit into the bowl and pass it on. And when it got to the front, got back to him, you know what he'd do? He'd take the bowl and he'd drink it. Now, you see that response he just had? That's the response we need to have to sin. Sin needs to disgust us just like that, and otherwise there's going to be no progress. Amen? 
that's the level we should be at. So keep that in your mind. When you think about sin, that's the response that you want to have to it. And as you feed your spiritual appetite with the word, with your personal trainer guiding you through it, you will find that the things of this world will become not just faintly dim, but they will become disgusting like that story was. Amen? Amen. The why is for your yoke. Now, in the gym, a yoke is usually something used solo. But when we think of yoke, we think of being bonded with someone else, someone who's going to help us in our journey. So you want to surround yourself with people who have the same goal as you. If I'm trying to lose weight and you're trying to bodybuild, we have two different goals. And it's not just your goal. In physics, it's something that's called a vector. And a vector consists of magnitude and direction. So you want to have someone who has not just the same goal as you, but the same drive as you. So again, I'm trying to lose weight, you're trying to bodybuild. We're both passionate about it. Our magnitude is the same, but our directions are totally opposite. Conversely, if we both want to lose weight, but every, five, every other day you're saying, oh, I don't feel like going to the gym today. Or I want to eat this hot dog. I want to eat this donut. We have two different drives, even though we have the same goal. So we need to find someone, find people we can work out with that have the same goal and the same drive, the same magnitude and the same direction. And we know the, we know the text, 2 Corinthians 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So we want to make sure we're surrounding ourselves with people that have the same goal, and we can both press towards the mark together. The E is for encourage. Now, when you encourage others that are in the same race as you, even if you're not working out together, but you see that they have the same goal and the same magnitude, the same direction, Encourage that person, and you find yourself will also be encouraged as a process. You go into that spiritual gym, and you see someone, wow, okay, now you have an opportunity to help that person, and it comes back to you. The verse I have for that is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, which gives a negative and a positive command. Ephesians 4, 29 says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it might give grace to those who hear. And we know in Galatians 6, 2, we're, 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 we're charged with bearing each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, again, we're going to touch about that when we look at the education because the, love, the law of God is love, isn't it? Love for God, love for man. And if we follow those with Christ's help, we will find ourselves encouraging others and all of these things will come into place. And the last letter, our second R in our acronym prayer, is rest. Now, when you're working out, you have to have rest between reps. Your body is not a machine. You're not a robot. And for me, I found that when I had a personal trainer, it was during those moments that our relationship was actually built. Now, my, my, my trainer's with me the whole time. So he's encouraging me while I'm lifting and while I'm doing whatever I'm doing. And we have a relationship building then. But when I'm resting and I'm getting recharged, now we're talking about other things. We're talking about life. We're talking about sports, relationships, whatever, what have you. I consider my personal trainer a friend because of those moments. And that's the same thing with us. Now, we're supposed to be working out spiritually every day. But God has promised us a wonderful blessing if we acknowledge that the rest that he has provided for us on that day, that's a day for us to gain a powerful relationship with us. And we have this promise in Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, one of my favorite texts where we see, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasures on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, not finding your own pleasure, not speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So we take that time on this holy day, here today, now, we're here. We can feast on the word and we can get ourselves in a more powerful relationship with God. Amen? So that, is our, that are our steps. Prayer, a personal trainer, repetitions, appetite, yoke, encourage, and rest. We'll look at that one more time with, when we look at education. Now prayer, of course, is the key. 1 Thessalonians 5.17, Paul admonishes us to pray without ceasing. Now that just seems so alien to most of us. And that transitioned us into our second topic about spiritual education, because as fleshly be beings, 
Is the idea of praying without ceasing come naturally to us? No, it doesn't. If all, if the longest prayer you've ever given was five minutes on your own, I'm not talking about these great prayers you hear up here. If on your own, your longest prayer was five minutes, and now you decide to go to an all-night prayer meeting, guess what? After five minutes, you'll probably be asleep. Or even if you do continue, I guarantee you that prayer would not be effective because you have not conditioned yourself to that point. You have to find yourself consistently praying and consistently growing and building upon that. And that is the foundation of this second topic about spiritual education. And as such, I'm going to talk, I'm going to bring us back to our friend Robin. Again, young Christian girl, well-behaved, well-mannered. But like many of us, young and old, she suffers from chronic procrastinitis. In other words, she's just lazy, particularly when it comes to school. She likes to put off studying to the last minute. She's never really studied before. And it's Sunday, and she has this big history test on Friday. And her parents are encouraging her, come on, Robin, let's get studying. And she's thinking to herself, I've got the whole week. I'm good to go. So Sunday, she doesn't crack open her book. Monday, she goes riding her bike with her friends. Tuesday, she plays video games. Wednesday, she starts to feel the pressure. She says, you know what, maybe I should, maybe I should crack open this book. She opens it, reads for a few minutes, eyes start nodding off, head starts nodding, gets bored, closes it. I can just cram tomorrow night, no problem. <laughs> well, Thursday comes along, and now she's in all-out panic mode. She realizes the dawning task that's ahead of her, because she's never studied like that in her life before. But she has no choice. And her parents, they forego the I told you so speech, speech, and they're helping her out. And she's in there trying to read these things. All the words are blurring together. She's trying to answer the practice questions. It's not making any sense. Her heart's pounding. Her head is right. Everything is going a million miles an hour. And she's just desperate to figure out how she's going to make it through this night. Hour after hour pass. By the wee hours of the morning, she finally feels like she's starting to get a grasp of this thing. And she goes to bed with a few hours to spare, and she feels somewhat confident. Wakes up in the morning, she goes into her history class, she's like, I think I've got this. But when that test is placed in front of her, she blanks out. All the dates look the same to her. All the names are just the same. It's just blurring together. All the answers, nothing is jumping out at her, and again, she's back to panic mode. Sweat on her palms. Head pounding, heart racing. You know what she does? She reaches over and looks at her friend, copies the answers down. The teacher who has been mulling over the room the whole time catches her and sends her to the principal's office. Now, there are a couple of lessons we can learn from this story. First and foremost, don't wait till the last minute to do anything. Especially if you do it once and it works out for you, it is a trap, I promise you. You start thinking, oh, I love pressure. I work better under pressure. It is a lie. <laughs> Amen? So please give yourself enough time. Maybe you won't be as bad as Robin and do something that you know goes against your morals, but give yourself enough time. But secondly and most importantly, the idea here is that you cannot just start doing something you've never done before, particularly on that kind of level. If you want to get into the habit of studying, you have to start that habit and be consistent at a small level and continually build and build upon that. And that takes us to our text, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. We're going to spend some time in this passage here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And Peter tells us here, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4. By which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now whose, whose power is at work here? Is it God's power or is it our power? Jesus' power. Let's keep that in mind. Also, he says at the beginning, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, that's very different than saying grace and peace be given to you. Something that's given to you, you may have the idea that it's always going to stay the same. It's a one-time deal. Multiply, we're talking about a process. Where you have something, you start with something, and you continue to grow in this knowledge, and it will multiply over time. 
Let's keep on reading. Verse 5, for, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. Again, we have a progression here. We're not just satisfied with one level because Romans 12, 3 tells us that every person is given a measure of faith. So at the beginning of this race, we all start with that faith, that, that faith, that first layer that Peter mentions here. But he says, don't stop there. And again, this is not your power. You are not the one who is adding anything. It is by the divine power of Christ that you are able to add to that faith all these other things. Verse 8. For if these things are yours and abound, that word abound in the Greek means to increase or to multiply in number. If these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, I can't say this enough. Whose power is at work here to make your calling and election sure? Is it your power? Is this righteousness by works here? No. Paul, uh, Peter made it very clear at the beginning this was not our power. So add to your faith, make your call and election sure. Now, verse 8 says it will be fruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as a result of this spiritual progression. Again, we're not being stagnant. We're continually adding to what has been given to us. We will have that foresight and peace that our sins have been forgiven. We'll be diligent in our calling. We will gain entrance into the eternal kingdom of God. Now, this reminds us of our earlier text, 1 Timothy and Timothy 4, that says the promise of the value of godliness in this life and in the life to come. But what are the benefits do we see in this aforementioned knowledge of Christ? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. Colossians 2, 2. Paul says here that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance and understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, some of us may meet, read this and think that the treasures and knowledge you're talking about are strictly have to do with the Bible, which is good enough on its own, amen? But he says all, all wisdom and knowledge will be given through an understanding of Christ. Thinking about that. Is this a new concept? Haven't we seen this in Proverbs 1.7? where Solomon says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding? What about James 1.5, where he says, if any of you lacks wisdom, ask God who gives freely to anyone who asks. I invite you to read Job 28 when you get a chance. Job is my favorite chapter, my wife's favorite chapter. Job 28, he has this long discourse about wisdom. He says, man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So he is in agreement with what Solomon would later write about the fear of the Lord being the beginning of understanding. Now, you high school graduates, I was about your age when I got a testimony. I heard a testimony at a church I went to, and it was, it was a man, he probably was about 10 years older than me. And he said that he had been studying for some test. I don't remember what kind of test it was, but he was in, in graduate school. And unlike our friend Robin... He had a regimen of study. He was not waiting to the last minute. He had been studying day after day after day. We're talking about hours on end. And it just wasn't making sense to him at all. And the day of the test is looming. This impending test, he's thinking his mind is going to fail. And he said one day, you know what? I'm just going to close the book. And he started praying. And not just praying, he opened the Bible. And he didn't just skim a few texts. He just didn't read a psalm here and there. He engaged in serious repetitions and serious study of the word. And hours felt like minutes, and he was being refreshed. Now, common sense would say that's a waste of time. You need to be maximizing every second because the test is right around the corner. What are you doing? Just like common sense would seem to say you have a deadline, 
Why aren't you working on Sabbath? You need every single hour. Common sense would say, we have bills to pay. I'm not putting money in the tide. But what do we know about worldly wisdom? It is foolishness, according to 1 Corinthians 3.19. The wisdom of the world is foolishness compared to God in God's eyes. So he had studied. He felt really good. And guess what happened when he opened those books again? The dots started to connect. Everything started making sense. It was like, wow, he's reading the same thing. And all of a sudden, everything is coming into place. And he went, he knocked that test out of the park, and he passed with flying colors. That was his testimony of getting an understanding of this will help you in your academics, will help you in every aspect of your life. Now, unfortunately, I didn't take that advice in college, but I did understand it when I was in my career. And I found myself, as a computer programmer, also struggling like he was and looking at a piece of code and pulling my hair out for hours and hours. Why is this thing working? And I'd close it up, and I'd start praying. And praying is good. But I found when I dove into the Word and I immersed into it and got out of what I was doing, I come back hours later, everything makes sense. Oh, there's that variable declaration. Oh, I had that in the wrong place. This is the beginning of all understanding, and you can't just read this on its own. You have to have your spiritual, personal trainer with you. Amen? Our scripture reading this morning was from 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. Thank you, Roger, for reading that. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But you must continue. Now, continue means that you started something, right? You must continue in the things which you have learned, meaning you have not just been satisfied with one thing you learned. You are building upon that and saying, I'm I'm going to keep on learning because there's always something available for me. You will continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, that's not just for the ministry. That's not just for medical work in the field trying to witness to others. That's for every good work. So wherever you are, you become a witness. Wherever you are, you have, are doing a good work, even if it seems secular. You're doing things to make a living. You're doing things to gain your education. You can be a light and be a testimony to others because you are now equipped for every good work thanks to studying and also remembering who wrote the book. It's not just as well to know the book, but also to know the author. Amen? So if you have never read the Bible before on a consistent basis, I can testify to you that consistency in in building that habit is more important than the amount. What do I mean by that? First of all, if you have a phone, you have a Bible. Amen? Amen. All of the apps are free. All the good ones, at least. You have all the versions are there. They're even in multiple languages. See, no habla inglés. No habla inglés, no hay pretexto. There is no excuse. You have everything you need right here. Matter of fact, exactly. She's right there with me. If you get home and you're tired and you don't feel like looking at that screen, you can press a button and it'll read to you. There's no reason that you should not be immersing in the Word. So I invite you, let's use our prayer acronym and apply it to this here. First, I would ask your personal trainer in heaven to give you a desire for the Word. If you don't have it, he will give it to you. And that he will help you be consistent and open your eyes to understand the Word. If you're not understanding it with the Holy Spirit, you're no better than scribes and Pharisees that knew this thing forwards and backwards, and it had no changing effect on their hearts. So you ask your personal trainer for that understanding and that desire. The R are the repetitions. I would recommend that you read one chapter a day, preferably one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And start somewhere, start in Genesis, start in Matthew, start at the beginning. Wherever it is, maybe you want to read some obscure books you've never read before. You've never read some of the minor prophets. You've never read Jude or whatever would have you. Start and keep on going. And you will find, you'll keep doing those repetitions that it will come natural to you. Don't be overambitious and say, oh, I'm going to read 20 chapters a night. You're going to crash and burn like Robin did. And then that habit will not get formed. But if you start small, your body gets used to it. I think scientists say it takes almost 70 days. Not 21. That was an old myth. 
It takes about 70 days on average consistently for something to become a habit. So you keep doing it even on a small level, your body will be used to that. The A is the appetite. So if you are reading this thing, I guarantee you, your appetite for other things will start to diminish. So maybe now you have it on your phone and hopefully you're spending less time on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat and you're sneaking a few minutes here and there to read the word, amen? The Y and the E, the yoke and the encouragement. Find other people who are willing to do the same thing with you, to be an accountability partner, someone that can encourage you and you can encourage them in return. And you find yourself those days where you feel like, oh, I don't feel like reading tonight, and you know your accountability partner is going to ask you in the morning, what did you read? Like, okay, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and do this thing. So God has given us each other to lift each other up, amen? And the R is the rest. Don't just think that because you're reading every single day that you can take Sabbath off. Sabbath is the day that you can feast. In the old days, in, in, in children of Israel, Sabbath was a feasting day. So I invite you on Sabbath to get an extra helping of that word. Amen? Amen. Our last topic this morning is spiritual purpose. So taking what we have learned with spiritual training and spiritual education and applying it. Otherwise, it's useless. If you, if, you, if you train to run a race and never run the race, what was the point of the training? If you study and study and study and never take the test, or you take the test and graduate and never do anything with a degree, what was the point of that education? Amen? So we're going to apply that education, and we're going to look at some examples of individuals who had a spiritual purpose. Now, Elder Hanif, I believe, mentioned in his prayer, Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Let's look there. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Sister Valerie had also mentioned this in her series. Daniel 1.8, we see the backdrop here. Daniel and his friends were in Judah. They were captured by the Babylonians, and they were given this opportunity to serve with the king and to eat the king's food. What did he say? Daniel 1.8, Daniel and his friends purposed in their hearts that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. We have no record that Daniel and his friends studied or purposed to have a knowledge of Christ, but here is the evidence that obviously they did. Because when the hard times came, even though here it is, they were captured. They were given this grace in the eyes of some, and they could have argued, we're not going to rock the boat. Let's just take this food. It's not going to be a big deal. And they said, we are running a race and every step we take must be going in that direction. If we eat this food and we defile our bodies and we defile our physical regimen, we're taking sideways steps or even backward steps. So there was no compromising that position. We also see later that when in the face of death, they refused to compromise and kneel before the statue. So obviously they had an understanding of God. They were building upon that. They were studying. And we see that God blessed them as a result. Verse 9 of Daniel chapter 1. God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chiefs of the eunuchs. If you follow God, he will give you favor. And we see this with Joseph. All the things that Joseph went through, everywhere he was, he got favor. Same with Esther. Esther received favor in the midst of bad situations. Let's continue. We'll see in verse 15, the blessings didn't end there, did they? Daniel 1.15. It says that at the end of 10 days, of course, they gave him this test. It said, give us vegetables and water to drink and see what happens. At the end of this 10 days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus, the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had all understanding and visions and dreams. Isn't this the same promise we've been reading? A fear of the Lord, an understanding of the Lord, bringing understanding and knowledge, and not just some things, and not just spiritual things, but in all things. And now that person, those individuals, can be mouthpieces and be testimonies about what the goodness of God can do in anyone's life. Down to verse 19, the king interviewed them, and among them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in the realm. God is faithful, isn't he? If we follow him, 
He is going to bless us beyond measure. He will give us wisdom. He will open doors of understanding for us. Yes, sir. And I love this second example of Jesus. All the others are good, but, but when it comes to my Lord and Savior Jesus, he, he really laid out the blueprint, didn't he? Yes, he did. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 40. And this is as a child. He grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So obviously he was studying. Mary was teaching him, and he was accepting those things, and they were having an impact at such a young age that these things were being added and multiplied to him, even at that age. Now we know that by the time he was 12, which was the age of our young friend Robin, here he was in Jerusalem. His parents lose track of him, and they're looking frantically for him for several days. Let's jump down to verse 46 of Luke chapter 2. Now so it was, after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard them were astounded at his understanding and answer. So when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to them, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. Again, here he is following God's purpose. Everything that he did was going to be taking him closer to the mark, not going to the left or to the right, but to the mark. And this did not come on his own. This came as a result of his studying and being filled with the Holy Spirit and getting to know his Heavenly Father. Not something that we cannot do. We look at Jesus often and we put him on a pedestal and we say because he was the Son of God, he was able to do these things. We have the same power. We have the same Heavenly Father, the same connection. If we would do the repetitions and we would follow our personal trainer and we would, all, all of these things would be added unto us. Verse 51 of Luke 2. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor, once again, with God and man. Now, notice here we mentioned education. And I must, if I'm competing in a race, I have to follow the rules. Following the rules means I have to study. I have to be educated about those rules. And God's law is a love for God, love for man. So we see here, even though he was out, it's seemingly doing his own thing. And following his purpose and telling his parents, I must be about my father's business. We see in verse 51 that he was still subject to them. He was a 12-year-old. He understood what his place was. So don't think that because you have a purpose, it's going to be contrary to God's law. Amen? Jesus didn't know exactly what he was getting into, did he? Some of us like to think that because he had this divine knowledge, he knew everything. But because he was divine and he was human, there were some points of uncertainty. So here he was. At a 12-year-old, and then the several decades after the fact, he's studying and he's preparing for the trials that would come. How many of you know who Steph Curry is? Steph Curry is a player in the NBA for the Golden State Warriors. How many of you know that he's an avid Christian? He's actually more passionate about his faith than he is basketball. Now, Full disclosure, I don't watch the NBA. I like basketball, I just don't have the time. So I did some research here. You have to be living under a rock to not at least be dimly aware of what's going on here. Uh, this year, his team set a record for wins at 73. And Steph Curry himself hit 402 three-point shots. Anyone who knows the game knows how incredibly outstanding that number is. Now bear with me because I'm going to tell you a story that happened to them last year. We're going to see this application here. Last year... His team was in the playoffs. I believe it was April. And they were playing in New Orleans in a, a, a very grueling series. And they found themselves in this game three down 20 points going to the fourth quarter. And Steph Curry comes out. And he hits one three after another, after another. Gets him back to the game. He hits seven three-pointers, including the one that would tie the game in the winning seconds to send to overtime. The game that they would eventually win and then two months later, they would win the championship. Now, we can look at his talent and say, man, God must have really blessed him with some talent. How was he able to do that? If you were to see the frame of him hitting that last second shot, his eyes were closed. If you were to see some of the other three-pointers he hit, when the ball's in the air, he's celebrating and running up court before he even goes in. 
How is that possible? Well, it came out that Steph Curry, every day in practice, does sets of threes. 100 threes. Now, most people would do 10 or 20 at a time. He does 100 threes at a time, and two days before that game, he hit 77 three-pointers in a row. And 94 out of 100, that is unthinkable. But that gives you a glimpse, because when he was in the fourth quarter and everything seemed to be running, winding down, it was muscle memory. He was making those shots blind. He was having the confidence because his body had been trained on a regular basis, training far and beyond what his contemporaries were doing, and now that was ingrained in him. And I guarantee you he didn't start off one day and say, I'm going to shoot 100 threes. He couldn't do that. Even if your body stood up to that pressure, you would find yourself ineffective and you'd get discouraged. No, you had to start small. I'm sure he started with 5 and 10 and 15 and 20. And because of that practice, it's like driving a car riding a bike, typing and looking at the screen, playing the piano and not looking at the keys, all of those things are natural because we have practiced them over and over again. And my Lord and Savior Jesus had the same experience because he went through that after his ministry, excuse me, after that whole ordeal at 12 years old, he found himself 30 years old in the wilderness and for 40 days he was preparing, he was studying, he was doing threes all across the court, shooting, 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 fasting and praying. And then the devil came. Fourth quarter, he's down. The devil's in his face, daring him to shoot. What does he say? Let's look at that. Luke chapter 4. The devil comes to him and says, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to be bread. And Jesus answered him what he had studied in Deuteronomy 8.3. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the house of God. Whoosh! Right over his head. Devil comes back. Okay, I, my lead's been shortened a little bit, but I still got this. He comes to him in verse 7. If you will worship me, all will be yours. Jesus didn't blink. Muscle memory. He knows Deuteronomy 6.13, he says, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Whoosh! In your face! <laughs> Devil starts to get a little worried. He says, okay, you want to use this Bible? I got the Bible too. And he tries to pull out something from Psalms 91, doesn't he? He says, throw yourself down on this pinnacle of the temple, for it's written, he shall give his angels charge over you. To keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Huh? Now he's locked up. Tight defense. Jesus not faced. Crossover. Gets around him, gets to the hoop, slam dunk. Deuteronomy 6.16. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Game, set, match. And I guarantee you. Every single one of us has that power. So us looking at Steph Curry, thinking we can never do that, I'm 38 years old. I can go out and practice till I'm blue in the face. I'm not going to be like that man. But I tell you something now. If you're 12 years old, if you're 2 years old, if you're 62 years old, you can start that path, if you've never started before, of studying, getting the reps, and being able to do the same thing that Christ Jesus did. Amen? Amen. Everything that we do should be pushing us closer to that mark. I can't say it enough. How many of you have ever seen someone who was on drugs for a long period of time or someone who may have been out there in the world, maybe going from one promiscuous or questionable relationship to another, and they get into the church, and now they're on fire for Christ? Now, you have been in the church 20, 30, 40 years. Like I said, you can quote a few scriptures here and there. You know your Bible, your favorite Bible stories. But when the problems come, you find yourself stressing, worrying, complaining. When you are, excuse me, down in that fourth quarter, you find yourself missing those shots. It's not natural to you. And you've been, again, practicing for several years, thinking that you had enough. Just like Robin, at 12 years old, thinking that she knew enough. But when the hard times came, she found herself crumbling. Now, except, and I look at this person here now. Only been in the church a year or two. And they're on fire. And they're quoting scriptures left and right. And you see them struggling, and you see them... God's got this. I'm not even phased. And you're like, what? How is this person who's been in the church by, by spiritual standards, their breath is smelling like Similac. They just stopped sucking their thumb two weeks ago. And here they are 
seemingly this adult, this spiritual adult, and here we are who should have the advantage, find ourselves as spiritual babes still. It is not too late for you to begin spiritual training and exercise and education and have your spiritual purpose. Amen? So I would encourage you all, particularly you graduates, you keep these things in mind. Just like Mary did. Mary looking at Jesus all these years, all the things that he did, she kept them in her heart. I invite you to keep these things in your heart and purpose that everything you do, think about it. Is it, giving me, is it taking me closer to the mark or is it taking me back? If it's a sideways step, it might as well be backwards because there is only the one direction. There is only one goal. So I implore you graduates, supporters, fellow soldiers of Christ to engage each day in spiritual training. Engage each day in education, learning about the book and learning, getting to know the author and building upon that education step by step, day by day, realizing the importance of your spiritual purpose, never wavering to the left or to the right. Because by God's grace, on that great graduation day, amen? amen, that great graduation day when the principal, the heavenly principal comes in the clouds of glory with that commencement speech saying, arise, graduates, yeah. and you step across that stage with your cap and gown sewn with the righteousness of Christ. And what does he have to say to you? He shakes your hand and says, well done, good and faithful servants. And he doesn't just hand you a diploma. He reads it to you. The diploma says, I, the father of the University of Zion, certify that Joshua Price and Lavender McGee and Andrew Kaju and Sharon Church has certified, has passed, has satisfyingly completed all requirements prescribed by my eternal law of love, thereby demonstrating outstanding evidence of celestial competence is hereby awarded everlasting life entitled to all rights and privileges appertain to a full-fledged child of God to live forever and ever with our Lord and Savior. Amen and amen. Thank you. I'm hoping for all those rights that you mentioned just now, my brother. I pray the Lord will bless me with them. And I pray that that will be all your desire as well. Amen? Thank the Lord so much for the word he sent us this morning. And I pray that we will ask him. The